Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Pierre Benoit Joly. I'm uh, director of research at uh, INRAE, and it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, breakout uh, session uh, where we will be dealing with um, risk assessment uh, um, about uh, and around biotechnologies. Uh, the idea is uh, to take uh, the um, example of biotechnology to explore boundaries and controversies on, um, on, on risk assessment and, and the link between the risk assessment and the decision making. So I, I guess it's a key um, issue in the frame of this um, international symposium on credibility of scientific expertise decision making organized in the frame of uh, the 10th anniversary of uh, the creation of uh, ANSES. Uh, so um, to uh, introduce this, um, uh, this, uh, this session, uh, I would just remind a few elements. Uh, first, uh, well, when we talk about uh, biotechnology, uh, a lot of the issues uh, boil down to GMOs, uh, genetic modified organisms. So it's not the whole biotechnology, but uh, it's, a, it's a big part of it in terms of uh, uh, investment in risk assessment and, um, and, uh, and also uh, uh, discussions in, uh, in public arena. So uh, uh, it's um, regulation of GMOs is, uh, has a long track record and uh, it's uh, still um, highly uh, a contentious issue. Um, and if we look at uh, the uh, international picture, um, it's uh, one of the, the striking elements is that uh, uh, there's a, a very different trajectories followed by uh, Europe and, um, and, and the US. Uh, in the US, uh, uh, GMOs are um, regulated as um, novel products uh, with the idea that there is a continuity between the traditional te techniques uh, related to, um, to, to plants or animals and uh, the new biotechnology uh, uh, techniques, whereas in Europe uh, we regulate uh, GMOs as new products uh, uh, and um, new processes <laughs> and uh, uh, with the idea that uh, the technologies involved are um, very novel and that uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, radical novelty we may have some uncertainty in the effects related to these uh, technologies. Um, related to these actually there, there are strong disagreements on the boundaries of risk assessment uh, Risk assessment may be uh, more or less uh, reductionist. So, uh, for instance, for GMOs, uh, you look only at the uh, molecular basis of uh, the transformation, or it may be systemic. So, you look uh, more broadly of, uh, at, uh, for instance, uh, environmental uh, um, uh, impacts of, uh, of the use of the, of the GMO. Uh, and related to these, uh, um, the, 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 the risk assessment may be strictly uh, scientific, meaning uh, based on um, a, a, a very narrow uh, 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 understanding of uh, the main disciplines in biology that have to uh, be uh, consulted for uh, the, the, the assessment of GMOs, or it may be broader, so uh, meaning that uh, uh, there is a need to uh, uh, understand more broadly the socioeconomic uh, um, impacts related to the use of, uh, of GMOs. And so we may wonder whether the the, what, what are the, the, the interactions and the complementarity, the respective roles of uh, risk assessment and, uh, and technology assessment? Uh, and one of the, 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 the complementary question is that uh, perhaps um, responsibility uh, may be, uh, uh, may be uh, um, uh, uh, involved in the way um, not only researchers but 
the actors that are the actors of the innovation uh, may uh, uh, draw their attention to some possible uh, impacts of uh, of the use of uh, of the technology beyond the 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 the, the, the regular uh, the regulation uh, uh, obligation. Uh, so. You, you may see that there are a lot of questions um, that we will be dealt in this um, in this uh, in this session. Uh, so um, perhaps, uh, well, we won't talk that much on uh, on GMOs per se, but perhaps uh, we will um, um, uh, center in uh, uh, focus uh, our discussion on more recent technologies, meaning the uh, the the. the the genome editing uh, technologies, and of course, uh, we cannot uh, uh, prevent to talk of uh, CRISPR technology, CRISPR-Cas9, which uh, uh, is described as a kind of uh, scientific uh, uh, revolution in the making, uh, very much related to uh, some uh, star scientists uh, uh, like uh, Jennifer Dubna and uh, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, uh, who recently uh, um, uh, were um, uh, recipients of the Nobel Prize um, uh, in chemistry. And, uh, uh, well, I, I won't enter into the detail, but uh, they have a, a very high uh, uh, public profile, meaning that uh, they are not only scientists, but uh, uh, they also uh, uh, give uh, some talks like uh, tell TED conferences and produce uh, some books uh, on very basic questions related to the use of uh, of these uh, of these uh, technologies. Um, well, in a way, and to uh, to, to 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 tell it in a nutshell, uh, actually, uh, uh, the risk assessment of uh, these technology boils down to uh, an ontological uh, question. Uh, the, 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 the thing to know is, uh, um, well, the, the, the answer to the question, uh, should plants obtained by the use of genome editing be considered as GMOs? And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, well, according to the answer to the, these questions, actually, uh, the uh, impact, uh, the impl implications in terms of uh, risk assessment and regulation are, of course, uh, uh, crucial. Um, so let me focus uh, just a while on the European situation. Um, the answer lies in the interpretation of uh, Directive 2001-18 uh, of the European Commission. This uh, directive, uh, we remember that it, this directive defines uh, what are the uh, GMOs, though in this directive, GMOs are defined as a, as a uh, organism, um, uh, so uh, with the exception of human beings. So it is the text of the of the directive. So uh, a GMO means an organism with the exception of human beings, in which the genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. And the term natural in, the, in, in this directive is uh, of uh, high importance. So it's not uh, the, 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 the time to enter into the detail. This directive uh, is um, quite complex in the way it defines uh, uh, GMOs before, beyond the, this, uh, the sentence I just uh, mentioned. Um, so, uh, we, we've had a lot of discussions in, in Europe uh, uh, on this issue, and um, uh, the, in 2018, the Court of Justice of the European Union um, uh, gave a decision uh, according to which uh, organisms obtained by new metagenesis uh, tools are GMOs and are in principle subject to the obligations laid down by the GMO directive. And in the decision of, of the court, what is uh, uh, of importance is the novelty of, uh, the, of, the, of, 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 the, of these uh, of these technologies, including uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and uh, we recognize the, the, the legacy of the European uh, regulation, which uh, uh, states that uh, 
uh, novelty may be related to uncertainty and that we have to have specific regulation related to uh, this high uncertainty. So recently, actually, this um, the Conseil d'État, so the highest uh, uh, French uh, jurisdictions, has taken a, a decision related to this, uh, this uh, uh, European Court uh, of Justice uh, decision, uh, and uh, um, it states that uh, uh, some of the organisms obtained by metagenesis uh, have to uh, respect uh, the regulation of, uh, of GMOs. Of course, the story is not that um, uh, simple, uh, since there are a lot of discussions and, 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 and conflicts on this. And recently, the French Minister of uh, Agriculture, uh, Julien de Normandie, um, in a, an interview with the uh, Agriculture newspaper, stated that uh, new biotechnologies are not uh, GMOs, which triggered a lot of, uh, of, of discussion. So this uh, ontological question is uh, hotly uh, debated. It is debated in, uh, in different uh, uh, public arenas. So, uh, of course, the, the opinion of the Haut Conseil des Biotechnologies started work to, working on this uh, in, the, in the 2010, and it published uh, an opinion that states that uh, um, it depends on the type of, uh, of plants that are produced by this uh, technology and that uh, we have to have a kind of uh, garde triage to define what kind of regulation applies to what kind of, of plants. Uh, so to just quote a, a few um, um, uh, um, reports on, on this issue. So uh, the Comité Consultative uh, uh, on Agronomic Research produced uh, uh, an opinion on this in uh, 2018. The French Academy of Agriculture produced a, a report in the beginning of uh, 2020. So we are in a situation where, um, like uh, uh, GMOs, uh, the, uh, the, the, the discussion on uh, the, uh, the, the type of regulation that we have to have for uh, these uh, new technologies is debated in uh, a number of arena. Uh, in, on this slide, actually, you, you have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, a copy of a paper we produced together with uh, uh, Claire Maris. Uh, I don't know whether you can, yes, okay, you can still uh, see the, the slide where we um, uh, we described for GMOs uh, more than uh, uh, 15 years ago the process of uh, disentrenchment. So the the, the idea that uh, uh, an issue um, which was uh, uh, discussed in uh, uh, a narrow range of uh, arena is now discussed in uh, different, uh, very different. Uh, uh, public arena and uh, the problem circulates and a lot of these uh, actors are de facto involved in the technology assessment of uh, the new technology. Uh, first question, uh, wh what should be the frame of uh, risk assessment? So uh, there are many questions, but uh, the first is um, how uh, can we take into account uh, the uncertainty and uh, uh, so uh, um, we, you, you see uh, uh, from the story of uh, GMOs and questions related to uh, these new technologies that uh, it is uh, one of the key questions to address. So, uh, for instance, how to take into account off-target effect and so on and so forth. Um, then, uh, one key question for risk assessment is uh, how to take into account broader implications. So, not only um, risks defined in a narrow sense, for instance, uh, uh, health risk, environmental risk, which is more broader, but uh, you know, seeing a metaphysical, um, uh, ontological, socioeconomic uh, power relations uh, related to the use of, uh, of, the, of the technology and how these um, uh, implications have to be, be, uh, to, to be taken into account in risk assessment, uh, which is related to the, 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 the type of relation we have to have with uh, technology assessment, which is a broader appraisal of uh, the impact of, uh, of technology. What about uh, the, 
responsibility of the actors. So uh, can it play a complementary role to the uh, compulsory regulation? And of course, and we, it will be one of the focus of uh, this um, uh, session, what about public engagement or public uh, participation? So uh, uh, how different uh, stakeholders have to have the voice, but uh, more broadly, uh, how we can uh, uh, integrate uh, some broader democratic uh, processes in risk assessment and technology assessment. So you see, we will have a, a, a broad appraisal of uh, the issue of uh, risk assessment, but it's a key issue to deal with uh, um, the credibility of scientific uh, expertise. This is uh, an underlying ass uh, assumption of this uh, session that we will be uh, discussing, I guess. So um, we have a fantastic panel to uh, introduce uh, these uh, issues. So uh, the first speaker will be Steve Lugarner, who is professor at uh, Cornell University in the Department of uh, no, it's the uh, Department of uh, Science and Technology Studies. I made a mistake. Then we will have um, Claire Maris. We, she's a senior scientist at INRAE, and she works uh, now. She's affiliated at the University of Edinburgh and at uh, LISIS in Paris. And um, then we'll have uh, Ben Herbert, uh, associate professor at uh, Arizona State University at the School of uh, Life Sciences. So uh, I give the floor uh, to um, uh, to uh, Steve Ilgarner. So uh, we have um, a scheduled about uh, 20 minutes uh, presentation for each one. After uh, each presentation, we will have um, um, a very short uh, 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 time for uh, uh, questions and answer. Uh, well, just uh, some uh, issues of uh, understanding, um, uh, and so uh, which uh, will uh, leave us uh, some time for the general debate after the three uh, presentation. So, um, Steve, it's uh, my pleasure to give you the floor. Okay. Thank you so, um, very much. Thank you very much, Pierre Benoit, um, and thank you f uh, to the organizers uh, for um, inviting me to this uh, meeting. Um, so, um, what I want to do today is um, uh, is talk about actually the way that um, people are imagining governance of uh, CRISPR and you know, biotechnology more broadly. And, you know, five years ago, the journal Science named CRISPR the 2015 Breakthrough of the Year. And, you know, an accompanying news article says, for better or worse, we all live in CRISPR's world. Well, such statements capture this sense of irreversible transformation, of a world that's different from everything that came before. And we could question this, but um, if we just suspend um, uh, disbelief uh, and set aside all caveats and take the claims of revolution seriously, then a question that immediately emerges is how should this new world, really thinking of it as a new world, be governed? You know, if humans have achieved a kind of unprecedented control over the basic material of life, how should they employ that power? And if the human genome can now be edited, should we change the human germline? Or if, germ, uh, if uh, gene drives can allow us to edit nature and to change the genomes of wild populations of plants and animals, should we use this capacity to edit the natural environment? And should those kinds of questions be approached you know, in the uh, American style of case-by-case -case risk assessment, looking at each product separately? Or are overall limits based on uh, constraining the use of these techniques uh, a more appropriate way to approach this? And it's very easy to say that these issues, as people often do, should be resolved by society. But through what mechanisms might we expect society to resolve them? 
governance in this new world seems to be totally unmoored. Not only do the categories like the human and the natural seem to be losing their foundational status, but finding and constituting forums where politically legitimate settlements can be reached uh, looks challenging, uh, not least because edited genomes, uh, if released into the natural environment, cross political jurisdictions, raising the question of where the locus of appropriate decision making is. Um, and um, uh, another central question that arises, as Pierre Benoit suggested by raising the issue of ontology, uh, which you know includes both legal ontology but broader ontological issues, what are the appropriate modes of reasoning for guiding societal responses to the possibilities that emerging bi biotechnologies like genome editing raise? Now, reflecting on technology and politics at the turn of the millennium, Sheila Jasnoff argued in a 2003 paper that the contemporary world is in what legal and political theorists might call a constitutional moment. Uh, that is a time in which basic rules and infrastructures that maintain social order are being established or fundamentally changed. And quite arguably, you can say that uh, this idea of a constitutional moment applies to the governance of genome editing today. The world is being, you know, reordered technologically, um, you know, through these techniques, sociopolitically, uh, as regimes for deciding how to fit gene editing into social orders begin to take shape, and biologically, uh, through the ability to remake organisms and ecosystems and so forth. And so that kind of brings me to my main question, which is how in this constitutional moment, if we'll call it this, are people imagining the governance of emerging biotechnologies? And the way I want to approach the question is in a kind of quasi-ethnographic way. Uh, I want to briefly examine how a, a diverse group of North American scholars addressed the question of governing CRISPR uh, at a workshop uh, that I attended as a commentator in 2016. And these people represented a range of fields, including science. You know, one of the people who in invented the gene drive technique was there. Um, law, philosophy, science, and technology studies, religious studies, and so forth. And their papers were published um, in an edited volume by uh, Iris Braverman. So what I want to do is read this workshop um, as what Jasnoff would call a constitutional moment, or really more like a, a constitutional conversation in which basic principles of governance are being articulated and debated. And obviously this event was only a scholarly workshop. It lacks decision-making authority and capacity. It doesn't have any legal standing. But such conversations are, are arguably as well important spaces where frameworks of governance get configured and advanced. Um, and these conversations at times make strides toward creating the shared ontologies that underwrite frameworks that later constitute new regimes of governance. So I want to consider a few of the different ways that some of the scholars present framed the challenge of governing genome editing. Um, and, um, you know, the argument uh, made by one of them, Kevin Esfelt, a gene uh, drive um, uh, inventor named on the patent, uh, was that people should be quite aggressive about editing nature, in effect. He said that, um, uh, you know, based on kind of utilitarian considerations and um, also a refusal to romanticize nature as it presently exists, human beings arguably have a moral obligation to edit nature to improve uh, the well-being of uh, people and animals and so forth. Now, this view was far from universally shared, but I put it out there to start. And then let me begin and just say a few ways that other people thought this area should be governed. So one uh, participant, Alexander Travis, a veterinarian and animal ethics scholar, framed good, gov good governance as being grounded in proper reasoning, that proper, the problem of governance is basically a problem of logically evaluating technological possibilities 
and based on you know moral principles, uh, values, and and careful uh, assessment of scientific facts to draw lines that would separate advisable from inadvisable or permissible from impermissible technologies and applications. And he uh, focused on the uh, evaluation of the promise, the promise of gene of editing, gene editing is in dogs. I, I heard a little feedback there that was confusing for a second. Um, but um, uh, he um, uh, you know, considers scientific evidence of risks, uh, he looks at the goal of, he, he's supportive of the goal of improving canine health, but also sees genome editing in dogs as a way of gaining knowledge that someday might be useful for human genome editing. Um, and he also articulated principles. The veterinarians have an oath um, and that defines uh, certain things you shouldn't do, like, uh, and he argues that they can be extended to say you shouldn't edit genomes in ways that will cause animal suffering. And he also argued that creating imaginary animals, like dogs with zebra stripes, should be considered impermissible. Although, um, precisely why, I don't think he had time to explain. Um, he, he, his analysis works by laying out key scientific facts and making technical distinctions. So, you know, one of them is between gene editing and gene repair, which uh, he describes as a subset of the gene editing category, which is to restore normal function uh, to a gene. And then these uh, kinds of scientific facts become moral guideposts. So his argument advances a particular vision of a proper order that's grounded in a hybrid of scientific and moral reasoning, uh, and that, uh, you know, he, um, and maybe others like him uh, would be well equipped uh, to uh, develop approaches. So the overall picture that emerges uh, is one of a promising technology that's susceptible to guidance by a partnership of science and ethics. Now Travis's mode of reasoning is central to bioethics and its efforts to govern emerging technologies, but it's not obviously the only mode of reasoning in play. Another scholar at the workshop, Ronald Sandler, also an ethicist, um, framed governance problems mainly as a matter of right reasoning. Uh, but for Sandler, uh, you know, for, uh, he uh, argued that you couldn't uh, make categorical judgments about the acceptability of genome editing at the level of the technique uh, in, a, you know, a, mat a matter that fits with U.S. regulation. Uh, he re would require a case-by-case case inquiry about each concrete proposal for uh, using the technology. And he's offered some preliminary criteria for guidance. But the other point that's where Sandler kind of d differs from Travis is on the uh, idea of how you should respond to things like the existence of controversy and procedural issues and public concerns and worries about such matters as playing God. And Sandler's vision of proper decision making explicitly allows room for public concern and community preferences uh, to become part of the governance conversation. So for Sandler, ethical reasoning by itself is not enough unless it also looks beyond its own analysis to consider public preferences and values that might be outside, you know, it, it, it wraps those into the into the uh, ethical issue. Now, in contrast to Travers and Sandler, um, uh, the biologist Stuart Newman uh, betrayed considerable skepticism about the efficacy of bioethical reasoning and regulatory institutions more generally to maintain moral boundaries. For Newman, uh, bioethics has failed uh, to govern biotechnology in the context of the human embryo, which is his main concern. For Newman, germline engineering of humans is a fundamental moral boundary. It shouldn't be crossed. But he forcefully argues that such moral lines are unable to withstand the pressure from the logic of contemporary research practices. He describes a world in which social forces, and especially the logic of commercial applications in biotechnology, override moral imperatives. Newman uh, filed a patent application in 1997 on producing chimeric human animal embryos and animals containing human and animal cells. 
And his intent when he filed this patent was not to establish ownership over Chimera, but to uh, you know, call public attention to the ethical problems involved in creating such things. Um, so that um, uh, move, as he uh, argued at the workshop, inspired a bunch of law review articles and raised a lot of consternation in the scientific community. And Newman describes how prominent scientists argue that no one is ever going to want to make those chimeras. And yet within a decade, one group had produced a mouth blastocyst containing human cells, and a second group had created a sheep with partly human organs. And so Newman concludes from those experiences that although you might, um, uh, we might really need restrictions on human uh, germline modification, as a practical matter, societies will have difficulty making them stick. The bar will always move. Uh, so uh, that's a, a quite a different vision from what you get in the, with the other two that I already described. Now Newman's filing of a patent application on human-animal chimeras could be understood as a kind of piece of performance art or maybe guerrilla theater to uh, use a 1960s term. As such, it can be regarded as an attempt to break outside of the mainstream modes of bioethical reasoning. And following a similar line of argument, Laurie Andrews, a legal scholar, made the case that artists can forcefully raise issues that can't be presented in what she regards as the overly constrained modes of argumentation that prevail in bioethics commissions and courts uh, and um, uh, similarly in risk assessment tech uh, exercises. She argued that public policy discussion needs to be informed by literary and artistic works that use irony and satire and, and problematize the normal and this sort of thing. So if Andrews and Newman call into question the efficacy of bioethical discourse, another scholar, Todd Kuplin, goes further. He expresses skepticism about the benevolence of the state in these matters sort of uh, altogether. On the one hand, Kukin is worried about research programs, for example, supported by the U.S. Department of Defense to explore the use of gene drives as a tool in biosecurity. Uh, and um, at the same time, he's impatient with the failure of state authorities to institute meaningful environmental protections regarding climate change, for example. And in this context, he foresees environmental vigilantes who might take matters into their own hands, for example, by using do-it-yourself biotechnology to alter species to protect against climate change or other kinds of actions along these lines. And he actually expresses some ambivalence about the question of whether vigilante action might ever be justified. So Kukin uh, thus raises the question of to what extent it will be feasible and possibly even to what extent it will be desirable to institute effective controls on editing the environment once the genome editing genie is out of the bottle. Other speakers at the workshop introduced still other ways of imagining the governance of genome editing technology. But I think the examples I've given are sufficient to demonstrate substantial diversity in what genome editing, in what the governance of genome editing might mean to specialist analysts of the problem today. If you read this as a constitutional con con uh, conversation, this sampling shows very different ways of imagining governance. The scholars advance quite diverse visions about what should be governed by whom, how, and to what ends. Uh, and, and underlying these visions are assumptions grounded in quite different modes of reasoning and ideas about what should count as evidence. It's really quite different to think that you need scientific and technical um, uh, evidence and to think that you need satire and irony. Um, although those could be made compatible. So they're, you know, quite different modes of reasoning uh, and also really different visions of what can be expected in terms of governance, what governance can be reasonably expected to be capable of achieving. So, so um, some of these authors 
really are focused on right reasoning. Uh, you know, others raise the question of whether sound governance is even possible, and still others are asking whether extra legal action might be potentially desirable. So before concluding, there's one last voice that's worth mentioning. And this is the unofficial voice of an audience member, someone who wasn't formally given a place on the agenda. Commenting from the floor, she said that she was blown away, not only by the speed with which gene editing technologies are taking shape, which was amply demonstrated at the workshop, but also by what she perceived as the invisibility of the ongoing debates about their use and regulation. She was troubled that decisions about whether and how we should edit nature were being made in institutions and ad hoc spaces largely outside of public view. And she wondered aloud how it could be possible that decisions of such gravity were being debated and potentially settled through informal and quasi-formal processes without some established mechanisms for broader and more meaningful public participation. In the context of these varied ways of imagining governance, the challenge of negotiating stable settlements given the differences in normative goals will obviously be substantial. The idea that um, it can be reduced to a simple quantitative risk assessment exercise, a cost-benefit analysis, uh, even one informed uh, by some concerns that extend beyond the merely technical, uh, is, looks like a weak uh, view for handling the situation that we're talking about. Clearly, there are going to be no simple checklists of best practices to guide us through the choices ahead, and the criteria and modes of, of engagement and, uh, and who should be participating are going to be central issues. So I suppose that the existence of ongoing constitutional conversations, like the one I just described, and like perhaps the one we're having today, uh, that these are uh, maybe the only reason for hope that modes of governing genome editing that are wise, inclusive, and democratic will emerge. Thanks. Many thanks, uh, Steve, um, for the very insightful, insightful um, um, talk. Um, as you mentioned, um, well, the semantic of revolution, if you take it seriously, uh, leads to raise a number of issues that uh, you clearly outlined on the issue of uh, how we govern these uh, so-called revolutionary Technologies is, uh, is a key issue, and uh, you clearly show that uh, we cannot stick to the narrow view of uh, cost-benefit analysis, and uh, that we have to open our mind. And when we do so, we see that uh, there are uh, competing modes of reasoning that we have to uh, take into account, and this uh, way to to elaborate uh, taking into account uh, these uh, different ways is. Uh, is very thoughtful. So I do not see any questions on the chat, but uh, perhaps my uh, uh, I did not advise the the, the participants to uh, to uh, raise the question on the Q and A. So I think that we will uh, we will go on um, with the next uh, speaker. Um, but uh, um, so thanks again, uh, Stephen. We will come back to the the, 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 the important points you you you, you raised. So uh, to the participants, uh, you can uh, leave uh, your your question on the on the space of uh, Q and A, and uh, we will take them uh, into into account uh, as as soon as as possible. Anyway, we have uh, time for discussion, broader discussion. Um, with uh, the audience, but also between the members of, of the panel. So uh, uh, I will now introduce uh, Claire Maris. Uh, so uh, Claire, are you here? OK, your presentation is there. So I guess that, um, so I guess that um, a little bit of echo. OK, there's a little bit of echo. Hello? Yes, OK, go. go uh, oh, wait. Yes, OK, go, go on. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? I, I had some technical problems. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, that's fine. Can somebody... Yeah. Uh, Pukyabinwa, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, good afternoon, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to this conference. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, we didn't uh, plan this, but uh, Steve finished on the question of public participation, and that is indeed what I'm going to focus on. So um, I'm going to talk about the credibility of public participation and how this relates to the credibility of scientific expertise in the context of these decision-making around risk assessment and technology assessment. I think uh, most of you will be aware that public participation has increasingly been incorporated into decision-making on issues involving science and technology. These decisions used to be the preserve of scientific and other professional experts, but over the last 30 years or so, there's been a movement to incorporate lay publics into the process. This is sometimes called public engagement or public dialogue as well as public participation. I'm not going to dwell here today on the potential distinctions between these terms. Uh, I'm just going to use the term public participation to encompass all forms of participatory decision making that involves lay people as along, working alongside scientific experts. So the use of public participation um, has occurred in particular around biotechnologies or in fact certain kinds of biotechnologies, notably the use of genetic technologies in crops and foods that Pierre Benoit mentioned in his talk. Um, in fact, you know, I, GM crops and foods were a technology, I would argue, that opened up a space around in the 1990s for public authorities around the world to test out the use of public participation for decisions regarding technology assessment. Um, and I would argue again that this was usually because scientific and political authorities felt obliged to do this in order to try to placate um, local controversies that were seen to be slowing down the progress of these technologies. So over the last um, 30 years, public participation um, has been used more and more for an increasing number of technologies, especially those that are considered novel or emerging, such as nanotechnology in the early 20, 2000s or synthetic biology in the 2010s. So I would say that today, public participation has become, to a large extent, part of the orthodoxy in the field of technology assessment, with people in positions of authority stating that it's generally a good idea, promoting it, and implementing it. And yet, at the same time, there are still debates about public participation and its use in technology assessment, about whether it really is a good idea in general, about when it should be used, and about how it should be conducted and I'm going to focus on these debates. Um, so I'm going to focus on the key issues in these debates. It's okay? Uh, I'm going to focus on key issues in these debates that come back again and again. Pardon? Il y a un problème? Is a problem? Le micro grésille un peu. Um... Mais c'est bon, c'est supportable. Hein. Mais c'est bon, c'est supportable. Hein. C'est supportable. Je suis désolé. Um, je suis sur la version. I'm, I'm on the web version and that might be causing some problems. I'm sorry. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so the, the key questions that come back again and again in debates around public participation are whose reality counts? whether the participants are legitimate and which kinds of participants are legitimate. And there are also questions about whether the process itself is legitimate and in particular how it links with decision making. And I'm going to argue that uh, a knowledge deficit model of public understanding of science underpins all of these debates and constantly fuels a misunderstanding of the arguments put forward by the the original proponents of public participation from the field of science and technology studies. And I believe that this means that public participation has broadly and overall failed to achieve what those actors hoped it could achieve. So on this slide I've listed some of the kinds of policy questions where public participation has been used to inform decision making in technology assessment. Um, the first type of question is, should a particular product be allowed on the market? So this was in fact the specific question face, faced by many countries in the late 1990s regarding the first genetically modified crops. 
and it was this question that was the focus of the first experiment in participatory technology assessment in France, which was a citizens' conference held in 1998. And there was a similar consensus conference in the UK in 1994, and a dozen or so other consensus conferences in this topic around the world in the 1990s. The second type of question is about the installation of a facility in a particular location, for example, a nuclear waste facility or a nuclear power plant. In these cases, the notion of a local public is more obvious than when you're talking about a product, a food product that's going to be put on the market. The third type of questions is uh, whether a technology is safe, or at least safe enough. These questions overlap with the first two, um, but here we might consider questions about how the risk assessment is actually conducted, and with which kinds of health and environmental impacts are taken into account. The fourth type of question is about whether a particular emerging field of science or technology should be funded with public money. Um, and this question was specifically asked in 2010 about synthetic biology in the UK, and a public dialogue was used to inform that decision. As, you, as might be obvious, there's a kind of progression um, in the nature of these policy questions. The first ones I've listed here are considered to be more downstream in the sense that they take place towards the end of the development process of a technology, whereas the last one is more upstream in the, in the sense that it takes place earlier in the development process. And in general, over the last 30 years, we've seen a shift in the use of public participation from more downstream decisions to more upstream decisions. And this is illustrated by the difference between the French consensus conference I mentioned that happened in 1998 that was specifically about whether or not to place a, a specific variety of GMAs on the market. And the public dialogue in the UK in 2010 that considered a much more upstream question of whether the field of synthetic biology should receive funding from research councils. So this move from more downstream to more upstream decision making was generally considered to be a good thing by actors from the field of science and technology studies who promoted um, public participation, because they thought it would allow participants to have more influence on the shaping of the problem at stake, and therefore they would be able to consider more fundamental issues that were of concern to them, not just a very specific uh, question about this particular GM corn, for example. Um, and the idea was also that it would enable decisions to be made before technological choices were locked into a particular path, and there were still more options that were open. Um, to everybody involved, including the scientists and the technologists. Um, however, although there's been a shift um, upstream in a chronological sense, with decisions opened up to lay participants at an earlier stage in the development of technologies, this hasn't really been accompanied by the expected shift in the motivations of the scientific and political authorities who commission and implement public participation. In many cases, the motivations remain mostly instrumental, the aim continues to be to avoid opposition, to placate controversies, and to attempt to increase trust in the established decision-making authorities, instead of enabling lay people to help shape the decisions. And this issue of motivation has been central to debates about publication for a very long time, not just in the field of technology assessment, but also in other areas. And this relates to broader questions of democracy and the link of uh, public participation with decision making. There have of course been debates regarding the appropriate level and kinds of involvement of ordinary citizens in public policy going back many centuries, um, as our historian colleagues always remind us. Um, but I'm just, if, I, if I just look at recent history, I'd say that public participation emerged in the fields of local planning and development in the 1960s and 70s and was imported into technology assessment later on. So the ladder of part citizen participation on this slide was published in 1969 by Sherry Arnstein, who worked in local planning in the USA and promoted the involvement of local communities in decision making, and in particular, in particular young people. Um, and based on her experience, she produced this ladder to describe different levels of democracy in public participation. So at the bottom, we have the idea that citizens are given no power at all. The process is being used to manipulate or lay the fears of citizens. In the middle, we have different degrees of tokenism, where the aim is maybe to inform participants and to give them the impression that they're being consulted. 
but ultimately the aim is to placate them and make them accept a decision that has already been made without them. At the top of the ladder, we have different degrees of citizen power, where citizens are considered to be partners and power is delegated to some extent to those citizens. And at the very top of the ladder, we might have a situation where power is completely delegated to citizens who make the final decisions. So this ladder and generally the thinking behind it has been very influential, fundamental to debates about public participation. And what I find interesting is that this notion that there's a scale between sort of manipulation of participants at the bottom and complete control by part of the, of the decisions um, at the other end is used by people who promote the use of public participation in decision making as well as by those who oppose it. So mostly it's used by people who are in favour of public participation, as um, Sherry Einstein was, um, and these people tend to um, argue that we should be at the top of the ladder, but they observe that in many cases we are actually closer to the bottom. But what I've found is that people who oppose public participation also assume that the aim of the process is to be at the top of this kind of ladder. The difference is these people don't want control to be hand over decision making to be handed over to ordinary citizens. But in both cases, the assumption is that when public participation is used, there should be a direct link with decision making and participants would be empowered to make the final decisions. So one problem with this understanding of public participation is that it assumes that decision making is a linear process punctuated with specific moments in time when a key decision is made. But we know, and certainly people who study policy making know, and people who are involved in policy making know, that it's actually a much more messy process and a much more complex one than that, and that there are many different events and processes and people involved over long periods of time before a decision is, that, that shape particular decisions and particular trajectories of decisions that are made. Another problem with this linear understanding of public participation is that it doesn't acknowledge the potential benefits of deliberation in itself, and especially deliberation that brings together people with different perspectives on a topic. For proponents of deliberative democracy, this is a key aspect of participatory de decision making. The idea is that the participants will develop their views during the process as they gather more knowledge from different types of sources and when they test their ideas against those of people with other perspectives. So it's not just a case of bringing together people who have different views and then deciding which one is the better view. The idea with deliberation is that all the participants end up developing their views and their opinions and their knowledge through the process of deliberation. But for, uh, so for, for proponents of this kind of deliberative democracy, the question isn't just who makes the decision but how the decision is arrived at and on the basis of what kinds of knowledge. And my, my impression is this argument tends to be overlooked in debates about public participation. And instead, the, dis the disagreements usually center mostly around who should make the decisions. Should, it be, should we be at, at the top of this ladder and let ordinary citizens make decisions? Uh, or should it be formal experts and we stay towards the bottom of this ladder? Uh, I'm going to skip this one. Sorry. Um, so um, these debates about who should be involved and how they should be involved have been particularly virulent in discussions about how to design and implement projects to promote development in poorer countries. And in the words of this book title from Robert Chambers from 1997, the recurring issue in those debates was whose reality counts. So in the context of development, the contrast between the people who were making the decisions and the people who were affected by those decisions was particularly stark. We had white experts from countries that had been colonial powers who were making decisions about the best way to promote so-called development in countries inhabited by black, brown and indigenous people from the ex-colonies. So Chambers and others argue that this meant that the local, lay and lived realities of these people were typically ignored. He stressed that these local perspectives were complex, diverse, dynamic and unpredictable. And yet distant experts tried to solve prob their problems using standardized universal forms of knowledge that often ended up being inappropriate to these local conditions. 
So in the context of technology assessment, the contrast between the formal experts and the lay people affected by their decisions is, is less obvious. Um, they usually live in the same country and come from similar ethnic groups. But there's still many important cultural and social distinctions that are less visible but have enormous impacts on people's lived experiences of a particular problem. In the context of technology assessment, discussions about public participation tend to focus on the notion that one group, the experts, has relevant specialist knowledge and the other participants do not. Um, so this means that there's a, an enduring sort of back and forth in these debates about the, the nature and the validity of the contribution of these lay, lay people and their realities. Um, on the one hand, when authorities in power choose to use public participation for their decision-making processes, we should be able to assume that they believe that lay participants provide some kind of added value, otherwise why would they do it? But on the other hand, the nature and legitimacy of the contributions from these lay participant is, participants is constantly disputed. So we have recurring debates about um, questions about whether these participants brings, bring new kinds of knowledge or they just bring their opinion or maybe their experience, their lived experience. Um, and whether the, the, whether the knowledge that these participants bring is based on some kind of specialist expertise, so in the context of GM crops, you know, perhaps being, being a farmer, or maybe local expertise, being a member of a particular community or of a particular culture, um, or perhaps on their lived experience of being poor or being disabled. Um, so this would be different particular knowledge that's based on the the profession or the um, particular characteristics of those people. Um, so then the, 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 the focus is on what the way in which the contributions from these people is different from that of formal scientific experts and what they can bring to the decision-making process. Uh, and, and this is a useful, of course a very useful debate to have but it, it leads to constant sort of boundary making between the scientific experts um, where we don't tend to really discuss what their specialist expertise or contribution is, it's assumed, um, and this idea that the others are not experts, so we need to define what it is that they bring to the table, in effect, because if they're not experts, um, they have to have something else. Um, and this debate, I would argue, ends up actually undermining their voices in the, pro in the public participation process. Um, um, and this ambivalence about the nature of the knowledge held by participants often leads to this a particular kind of search for an ideal public or the real public um, who, and and this is very specific, this is very um, obvious in the UK in, in, uh, when public participation is used for technology assessment. There is a search for a particular kind of public that has no prior interest and no prior knowledge about the topic or the technology that is going to be discussed and, and where a decision is going to be made. So samples are made from, uh, based on traditional socio-demographic characteristics such as gender, age and social class and then there's a, a process of ex that is used to exclude people who have a prior interest or knowledge and a definite exclusion of anybody who, might, who is known to be or, or found to be an activist or participant in interest groups and NGOs involved um, in something related to that topic. So, so in, in the end you end up sort of constructing this amorphous pu public that is ignorant. You, you've chosen people and you've, uh, by, uh, that you define yourself as being ignorant on the topic at, at stake. And, you've done, and you do that, the organizers do this on purpose. Um, but then it, it sort of draws yet, you know, again it redraws this boundary between the people who know and the people who don't know. And I believe this reinforces the notion that their contribution, their contribution in the end is uninformed opinion and is not based on knowledge. And I think it, it reveals especially this, um, uh, activ this uh, aim to um, actively exclude activists from interest groups. And again, this is very, very particular to the UK. I know, I know it's different in France. 
Um, but I think it just relieves how, it reveals how uh, a key motive of, of public participation is actually about neutralizing or at least circumventing these other forms of what Michel Canon has called wilder forms of participation um, in the form of social movements. Uh, I'm, okay. um, so I believe that this, these debates are constantly un, um, underlaid by this deficit model of public understanding of science according to which any misgivings people have about science and its applications stem from their lack of understanding of the basic scientific knowledge and scientific method. And therefore, all we need to do is to educate this public, and this will increase public support, allay their fears, make people behave rationally, make them trust the authorities. And although we've, you know, many, again, again, and again, people have said this is an old model, it's no longer um, in existence, and people understand this is not how things work, we see it coming back again and again in the debates. And this is what Ryan Wynne has called the ghost in the machine. Um, it's just continually being slightly modified and constantly, constantly being reinvented. But there is an underlying um, assumption by many of the people involved, including some of the people who promote public participation and who use it, that somehow um, Lay, lay, lay participants are defined by what they don't know rather than what they do know. Um, and this means that we don't really know. Um, well, it, this leads to, this, to debates about whether if we take on board their perspectives, it means we're rejecting expert knowledge. It leads to these boundaries between the knowledge of lay people and the knowledge of the experts. I, I can see Pierre Benoit getting nervous. This is my last, start, last slide. Um, I've, so my question is, you know, maybe we have actually come full circle. Public participation emerged out of a critique of these distant experts and professionals making decisions that impacted people um, without those, those experts having enough knowledge of the local, complex, diverse, dynamic and unpredictable realities of those people. But what we have now is public participation that is advocated, sponsored and implemented by a new set of experts and professionals of public participation who promotes a particular standardized sort of technologies of participation that can off and often are just as distant from the local realities. Thank you. Many thanks, Claire, uh, for uh, this uh, very broad picture on uh, public participation. Well, you raised many questions um, and you really showed that, uh, um, well, Public participation is not only about credibility, it's also about uh, legitimacy and we, we have to come back to this and so also the idea that um, it's not about uh, only about uh, risk management but the very idea of uh, uh, upstream public engagement means that uh, we have to uh, make the link between the uh, the use of the technologies and the production of the technology and which makes that uh, um, the, the, we have to raise the question whether actually risk assessment and public uh, and technology assessment has to also deal with the governance of uh, innovation. So um, you helped us to open up the, the questions, which is a very important. I don't know. Yes, there, there, there's a question for, from the audience. Uh, so I will uh, read it for you. What is the role of public perceptions um, uh, and public perception may be considered as biased? Um, what, what, so what are the role of public perceptions in the outcomes of deliberative processes? Um, and is it a, a way, a possibility that deliberative processes uh, modify the, the, the perception? And is it possible to better know uh, the public perception and to perhaps uh, have some knowledge and model them. So, uh, can you make the, make the link between uh, public participation and the knowledge we may have on public public perception? 
think I understood the question. Actually, some of the, I, I, I skipped some slides in the middle, actually, because I knew I was, I realized my talk was going to be too long. And I think it addressed this question a little bit, that there can be a blurring also between research, like I think like this questioner asked, the, we can do, as a social scientist, uh, we can, and I have done, uh, research on public perceptions and public attitudes to genetically modified crops, for example. And then as a social scientist, I can feed this information back to policymakers and they can use that to make their decision making. Um, and for me, that's very different from public participation. But in, in some cases, the distinction is actually not that, um, that, that clear. And in the UK, often actually what's uh, been called public participation in, in, ends up being slightly novel methodologies to find out what, pe what people actually think about something and then and there's no direct, there's no, even no attempt for a direct link with decision making, that's just, that information is then fed to the policy makers, it might be fed to the scientists and it's maybe um, publicised in the, in the media to, to inform a public debate. Um, but that's different to having some kind of process where the participants actually um, have a direct link with the decision makers or the decision making um, and they, the participants then actually tend to um, take that role on board in a very serious way, in a very different way to what, compared to if they're in a, in a focus group. I mean, so Pierre and I actually analysed that consensus conference in 1998 in France and the, it was very striking how the citizens, you know, um, took on that board and, talk, and they said, we citizens believe that we should do the X, Y and Z and you don't get that in a focus group. Uh, a, a more social science kind of focus group. I, I hope that sort of answered the question. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, thanks, I, think Claire. Um, I think that. I think that. Well, there's an echo. There's yeah. An echo. I'll switch my mic off. Okay. Thanks. Um, this um, is also related to what you say. Well, you 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 highlighted the importance of deliberation. And uh, you say that uh, what is important is uh, not only the decision taken, but also how the decision has arrived. At, uh, and I guess that uh, uh, so when you look at uh, the public participation like this, actually it is very much uh, related to to the process and not only to a way of describing the reality of out there and trying to represent uh, the idea of um, of, a, of a public. Uh, and I guess that your presentation was very clear on these. So um, we, we now, now move to um, Ben uh, Albert. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Ben is, uh, is within the School of uh, Life Sciences at uh, Arizona State uh, University. And uh, I guess that he, he will bridge uh, very nicely uh, both uh, um, issues. So uh, the issue of uh, uh, gene editing and the issue of uh, public deliberation in his talk. So, Ben, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much. You can see me and hear me? Yes? Okay, good. Um, so, thank you very much, Pierre Benoit, and to the organizers for having me here. Um, uh, just as Claire didn't coordinate with Steve, I have not coordinated with Claire, and yet the the uh, I'm picking up precisely where she left off. So, so um, everything is working out quite nicely. Uh, what I want to talk about today are some of the broader issues that that I, I think Claire put on the table around, and and for that matter, Steve around the forms of reasoning um, and notions of the forms, the appropriate forms of reasoning that go into processes of risk assessment, technology assessment, and broader forms of deliberation about what's at stake, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis questions of responsibility. And as a sort of matter of framing, I want to say, first of all, that though we, we may tend to sometimes think of assessments of risk um, inside of the institutional formations that are sort of responsible and competent to engage those or seen as responsible and competent to engage those questions of risk. Of course, fundamentally, these are all questions of democratic governance. They're questions of who is given responsibility for asking the salient questions and rendering judgment about them. Um, and questions of public participation are, of course, questions about the ways in which those processes are held accountable or in which the forms of inputs are diversified and so forth. And so what I want to talk about today are are um, 
is to step back from those institutional formations and spend some time looking at patterns. And this is a view from my side of the Atlantic. So my cases that I want to talk about are American cases, but I think there are broader lessons to be learned. Um, that the sorts of patterns that inform even spaces in which to say decision making is given to the people, um, or there is a commitment to include in, to forms of inclusive to public engagement and inclusive forms of deliberation. So this is a, a characterization um, of the right way to do governance, technology assessment, ethical deliberation and governance um, from the Presidential Commission on Bioethical Issues under the Obama administration, whose chair was Amy Gutman, who is one of the leading theorists of deliberative democracy. Um, and and uh, this this statement um, offers a, the sort of aspiration, this was from their first report, um, towards the kind of, of deliberative democratic orientation towards, towards um, evaluating the, the technical, social, and ethical significance of, of emerging technologies um, uh, and building capacity to, to uh, engage public deliberation in the process. So an inclusive process of deliberation informed by relevant facts and sensitive to ethical concerns promotes an atmosphere for debate and decision making that looks for common ground. So this commitment to common ground, or rather the construction of common ground is what I want to take as an object of interrogation today. Because as virtuous as this sounds on the surface, um, there are there are sort of deeper commitments and patternings to discourse um, that that uh, I think should give us some pause. So, oh, I sorry, I'm to click here. Uh, so this this idea of common ground as a basis for reason public deliberation, I want to argue, um, is a site in which the sort of foundational work for these processes of deliberation tend to take place with significant consequences for the shape of those deliberations. So common ground, far from an achievement that emerges out of deliberation in the cases I'm going to talk about, are constructions of prerequisites for reasoned public deliberation. In effect, what is getting governed is, is reasonableness. Um, and the notions of risk that are at stake in these conversations are as much notions of about the risks associated with unreasonableness and the need to, in effect, set the parameters of reasonableness and delimit what is common and what is not, um, as they are about um, considerations of the technologies themselves. And so what's at stake here are the forms of epistemic authority and conditions of participation, rules of engagement, terms of debate, and the sort of governing imaginations, in particular of progress, of the way things can, should, and must unfold in spaces of innovation that are the inputs into the parameters within which questions of reasonableness get asked and the contours of deliberation get shaped. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay this out through three sort of little mini cases, three sketches um, focused on facts, frames, and futures. So first case, this, is, this one explores delimiting the terms of debate which becomes an exercise in diagnosing democratic failure. So this takes us back to the, to the early 2000s in which the US and much of the world was engaged in, in sort of significant discussion around human embryonic stem cell research and human cloning. And this is a report issued by the National Academies, National Academy of Sciences um, that is a, a kind of technical report on human reproductive cloning and associated risks and so forth. But one of the main projects of this report is to describe, is to delimit the terminology in the name of informing public deliberation. So because one method to establish a human embryonic stem cell line uses a process very similar to the first steps in reproductive cloning of complete humans, it's easy to understand how a scientifically literate society could become confused about the, about the overlaps between these two things. And, and uh, this was a sort of first effort to draw a kind of demarcation between somatic cell nuclear transfer, the technique employed in cloning, um, for research purposes versus for reproductive purposes by drawing a, a kind of terminological distinction through, through a demarcation made in nomenclature grounded in expert authority. This became a kind of effort 
a, a sort of, well, it was a political effort to shape public discourse in the name of making public discourse possible. This is a, an op-ed in Science from Lee Silver. Cloning has a popular, the term cloning has a popular connotation that's impossible to dislodge. We must accept that democratic debate on cloning is bereft of any meaning. So the, the infelicity of the terms popularly used to what experts saw as the key ontological demarcations between two different technological projects and two different biological entities um, that those projects produced became a basis for kind of diagnosing a democratic deficit. That democratic debate is bereft of any meaning. Science and scientists would be better served by choosing other words to explain advances in developmental biotechnology to the public. So this is the knowledge deficit as Claire was pointing out, but it's, but it's, it's, it, the knowledge deficit is only step one. In fact, the knowledge deficit is the basis for diagnosing a democratic deficit and thereby laying claim to a kind of position of evaluation of reasonableness, of, of, of uh, reasonableness on, on moral questions, questions that, that uh, ostensibly um, belong to democracy. The International Society for Stem Cell Research uh, a couple of years later um, made an official change to nomenclature um, uh, the change in terminology to basically eliminate the term cloning from the terms that they used to talk about this process of somatic cell nuclear transfer was in the name of facilitating frank scientific, ethical, and public debate on stem cells and their potential for medicine. The changing the terms of the debate was about healing a, demo a capacity for democratic deliberation, the construction of common ground in the name of producing democratic reasonableness as opposed to merely technical uh, correctness. Um, in fact, and this is a very interesting moment, this rose to the level of, of uh, public decision-making in a, in a um, referendum in California, a ballot initiative for stun funding stem cell research, in which there was a lawsuit in the background led by a group of extremely prominent scientists, including a host of Nobel laureates, um, challenging the use of the term cloning in the guide that would inform voters about what they were voting on. Uh, and at stake here was a question of whether this was an ontological representation that relied upon technical expertise to determine whether it was correct or not, or whether this was free speech at its apex, political speech, in which a value-laden evaluation given to the voters in a decision-making process um, is, is uh, you know, I mean, this is sort of, sort of free speech at its, at its most important form. And so I offer this to give, to show that this is, that what's at stake here are constructions not just of the, the, um, the technical, material, biological entity, but of democratic deliberation itself and the processes of reasoning associated with it and the right role of experts in diagnosing not just the sort of epistemic preconditions for having a conversation, but what counts as a conversation that has meaning in, a, in the context of a, of a um, democratic deliberation. Okay, um, sketch number two, disciplining discourse, authorizing and naturalizing asymmetries. Okay, so you've seen this quote before from the Presidential Commission, again, led by one of the leading theorists of deliberative democracy. That report was focused on this, Craig, Craig Venter's synthetic organism, one of the sort of first moments in the emergence of synthetic biology in the, in the um, 2010, roughly. The committee, this is the National Bioethics Commission under the Obama administration, saw a rare and exceptional opportunity to be forward looking instead of reactive, to be upstream, to use Claire's terms. And yet, where they arrived at was a set of downstream controls, including in particular focused on public discourse itself, so that the preconditions for participation in a kind of technology focused deliberative democracy were, they proposed, a publicly acceptable fact-checking mechanism for public claims about prominent advances in biotechnology that would facilitate reasoned deliberation and improve public perception and acceptance of emerging technologies. The examples that the report gives of the kind of public discourse that would need to be fact-checked are, are, is discourse like creating life and playing God. That, that only once a sort of public discourse is disabused of these, of these 
well, factually incorrect, it's a very strange characterization, but factually incorrect constructions, can public discourse be reasoned? So the upstream opportunity basically becomes an opportunity to police the downstream public discourse that emerges in a reactive mode to the, the um, development of new technologies. But take note that there's a sort of a double standard here, that the discourse of playing God is actually widely deployed by the leading figures in these domains. This is George Church's book, Read Genesis, Jennifer Doudna, you know, one of the co-inventors of CRISPR who was mentioned earlier, A Crack in Creation. You know, the, the, there's an, a sense in which, and this comports with what Claire was saying about, about the sort of permissibility afforded to the, the permission afforded to the experts and the skepticism um, oriented towards public discourse. Uh, it, well, I mean, it speaks for itself. The, the committee in its sort of judgments around synthetic biology calls for this, only as much oversight as is truly necessary to ensure justice, fairness, security, and safety while pursuing the public good. And this is a key presumption that the public good and the pursuit of the public good resides in the scientific and technological projects themselves. And that questions about justice, fairness, et cetera, um, may arise downstream um, as matters of public concern, but that, the, that those are moments in which interference may be warranted, but only so much interference as is necessary to achieve those ends without disrupting the pursuit of the public good. This is a, this is a committee led by a deliberative democratic theorist who thinks that judgments about what the public good is are meant to arise out of deliberative democracy itself. So the delineation between science, technology, and democracy is doing absolutely fundamental work in including the way in which a kind of a monopoly um, is, uh, uh, is asserted on what counts as progress. So that story is this story. From science to technology to society, progress follows this trajectory, and sort of questions of, of uh, right interventions of publics lie um, not in the questions, in questioning this construction itself, but in questioning um, particular instances in which um, unintended consequences might accompany what is presumptively uh, a, a uh, progressive um, uh, process. Okay, last one that picks up on this this uh, issue of progress. And here we come um, up into the present. So this is a statement. And I want what I want to draw attention to here in particular is the way in which ethical expertise or processes of ethical deliberation and judgment fit into this scheme. So this is Arthur Kaplan, a very prominent American bioethicist commenting on a technique um, for making changes in human embryos that alter the mitochondria. It's so-called mitochondrial transfer. Um, which have a germ effect on the germline, they're heritable, um, but it's the mitochondrial changes in the mitochondrial genome rather than the nuclear genome that are heritable. And the concern was raised in, in giving permission for this kind of germline genetic modification, you're in effect opening the door to nuclear genetic modification. This is in about 2014. Uh, he says, I understand the concern about where we might go. I'm going to worry about that when I get there. There's a kind of mode of deferring the question until the technology is upon us. And indeed, this is precisely how things played out. This is tw the 2015 International Summit on Human Gene Editing. This is David Baltimore, who opened the meeting. He opened the meeting with these comments. The unthinkable has become conceivable. Now we must face the questions that arise. How, if at all, do we as a society want to use this capability? This is a science to technology to society story. It is now that the technology has come into being is on the threshold of, of, of at least potentially being deployed into society. Society must ask the questions, um, you know, what do we want to do about it? But that story itself imposes constraints on the capacity to ask those questions. And you can say, well, it's, you know, an upstream downstream problem, have it further upstream in the stream. But what I want to argue here is that it's the conceptualization of the stream, the way the current flows, the direction that it flows, the presumption that that is natural and necessary. And it's just a sort of a question of what moment in the sequence um, it, uh, the conversation takes place. And the notion here was, again, that this was an upstream conversation. 
This is a report issued by the National Academies in 2017 that asks the questions, asks questions about human genome editing, the application of genome editing technologies to human beings, particularly human gametes and embryos, so heritable genetic modification. Incidentally, one of the chapters in this report, one of seven chapters, is on public engagement. It was one of two reports issued by the National Academies, the other one being on, on CRISPR-based gene drives, um, that foregrounded a kind of commitment to public engagement as essential to processes of governance. And yet, the report itself, in effect, answers the question that ostensibly would have been the question that was the focus of public engagement, namely permissibility. And this is significant because this was a, a very significant reversal of a kind of longstanding consensus position that that heritable that, that human beings should not be genetically engineered. This is a sort of provocative headline that captures the sort of nub of the report. How could a committee of roughly 20 reverse a kind of consensus um, on this matter while at the same time affirming the the importance of public engagement in the process of making important decisions that affect the human future. This is the explanation by the one of the co-chairs of the committee. There's been a line drawn by many that says you should refrain. That was mostly because there was no way of considering how to do that at all. In other words, judgments that it shouldn't be done were meaningless because it couldn't be done. Nobody was arguing that it should be done because it couldn't be done. But now that it can be done, any judgments about whether it should be done are in effect obsolete. They have been outmoded by the state of the technology itself. So it's a sort of construction of who takes priority in processes of making judgments. Back of that was also the sort of notion that the fact that it can be done basically means that it will be done. And the question of whether it should be done is sort of out the window. And all that remains is the question of how it should be done. And indeed, it was just a little while later that it was done. Everybody, I'm sure, is aware of this story. But what's important about this story is how the story was constructed vis-a-vis -vis the, the stream, the process, the sort of normal out playing out of processes of progress in scientific and technological development. And the characterization of this actor uh, who, who created genetically engineered babies in China as a rogue became a kind of way of articulating responsibility as an opposite to this rogue. So the, the, the rogue who violated an international scientific consensus um, becomes the sort of opposite to that responsible scientific establishment. The scientific community is the opposite to a kind of outlaw science. It's the us versus the them. This is a statement made by the president of the National Academy of Sciences at the release of that 2017 report. As is always the case, the speed at which the science is out advancing outpaces society's ability to grasp its implications. Okay, so this is a, a kind of truism often repeated. What I wanna to point to is the way in which this, this sort of reifies, this characterizes the processes which give us scientific and technological progress and the necessary relationship of other kinds of institutions of for assessing risk for evaluating ethical ethical and social concerns etc cetera, etc cetera, for engaging publics um, they necessarily lag behind they necess they can only react in effect here is a statement that he Zhanghui, the the chinese scientist made to me in, an inter in a series of interviews that I conducted with him between the time his story came out um, and when he was criminally charged and basically was disappeared by Chinese authorities. If we're waiting for society to reach a consensus, it's never going to happen. But once a couple of scientists make the first kid, it's safe, it's healthy, then the entire society, including science, ethics, and law, will be, be accelerated. It will speed up and make new rules. So I broke the glass. This is an explanation of, of why he felt himself to be authorized by a scientific establishment that tells a particular kind of story about how progress happens and the right and necessary relationship between that progress and the processes of making sense of what it means for human lives and societies. Take note, 
it's very close to the quote I just put up from Marsha McNutt, the president of the National Academies. And it's awfully close to what the leading theorist of deliberative democracy in her ethics committee had, had to say about the re relations between science and society. And indeed, there was a notion that this event was inevitable. The boundary would be crossed. And when it was indeed crossed, it was in effect called inevitable. The prophecy had, had been fulfilled. And the discourse that surrounds this is sort of permeates constructions of the relationship between science, technology, and society. CRISPR babies, when will the world be ready? This is from one of the sort of main journalists that writes for Nature, right? It's just so automatic that it slips right into the discourse. The question is about the world, when the world will be prepared to accept the future, a future which is given in advance, which is inevitable. Uh, as opposed to asking the ways in which that future are an expression of the empowerment or disempowerment of actors in that world. Here's Jennifer Doudna last year. In the year since Hu's announcement, some scientists have called for a global te but temporary moratorium on heritable human genome editing. The, the rationale for that moratorium was to create space for deliberation. However, I believe that moratoria are no longer strong enough countermeasures and instead stakeholders must engage in thoughtfully crafting regulations of the technology without stifling it. In effect, they are no longer strong enough countermeasures and therefore we must acquiesce to the future, which is inevitable and circumscribe the questions that we ask to questions about narrow constructions of risk, mitigation of risk and regulation. Okay, so just to sum up very quickly, since I think I'm past my time here. Um, what's at stake here? What's at stake here are the, the sort of fundamental ordering commitments, um, sort of institutional, normative, and discursive that shape the, the conditions under which the questions are asked in the first place. So it's not just a question of participation. It's not just a question of who's at the table. It's a question of what the convening is, what the kind, what const, what is, what are the constitutive elements that go into that convening? The constitu constitutive and you might say constitutional con vocabularies, the sort of fundamental rules of reason and discourse that configure the conditions under which speech happens. And back of these are naturalized sovereignties, not least among those, a kind of sovereign science that stands in a position of authority and judgment vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the nature of its own achievements and creations. Sovereignties which are so naturalized that they feel natural uh, and, and therefore these sorts of imaginaries permeate discourse, uh, you know, just across the board, across including, they shape in effect the terms of debate, the conditions of participation, the framings of the problems and so forth. They're not merely strategic, um, their their fundamental imaginations of the kind of ontological fabric, not just of the, the technologies under concern, but science and technology and democracy themselves. And so in effect, what's at stake are questions of democratic governance, the ways in which it's conceived, the ways in which science and technology and the institutions that they live in sit within those regimes of democratic governance and the ways in which horizons of moral imagination are imposed upon processes of deliberation and governance, or themselves are taken as objects of deliberation, critique, um, and challenge. Uh, this is Hannah Arendt, 1958, commenting on technological developments, including, by the way, human genetic engineering, as a matter, as a locus of concern, because at stake in those moments is the potential for the human to lose the capacity lose a fundamental human capacity that is the capacity for kind of political life Her, she worried over the the that we may become unable to understand that is to think and speak about the things which nevertheless we are able to do and so what is at stake i think is not just the asking the question should we do these things we are able to do but the the repeated assiduous commitment to asking are we capable of thinking and speaking? What are the ways in which we are enhancing or inhibiting um, our capacities to speak? 
because governance of science and technology is a problem of democratic governance that depends on collectively seeing, affirming, and constantly revisiting how, why, and to whom we delegate authority and responsibility for rendering judgment about the scientific and technological worlds we um, produce for ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, ben, I think that uh, the, your, your focus on the, on the three sketches with, um, um, uh, well, altogether linked to frontier biology and uh, most of them related to human being at the merit to, um, to push us to sing uh, something at the, with the paroxystic uh, reflections. And uh, it's clear that um, we can see the limits uh, of uh, utilitarianism. Um, and and, and the, you, you nicely show how the, how the science, technology, and society relation is, uh, is recasted in, in, this, uh, in this story. The common point with um, with Steve is the is the the idea of uh, well, I don't know whether you, you use the name but uh, the the sleeping slope the idea that uh, when we engage in a direction actually there are some irreversibilities and uh, we cannot uh, have the control of the of the process which is a common idea and also the what we call the Garbor law so the idea that uh, what uh, is invented will be anyhow uh, used. So uh, 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 in relation to uh, uh, the, the, the claim of, um, of uh, the statement of uh, Baltimore saying, okay, we'll see after we have to do it. Uh, I guess that it tells some, it tells something. So um, we have some questions. So uh, uh, the first question is, uh, uh, I read it, uh, so the three conditions presented to have a common ground may differ from a country to another, a culture to another, and so on. How could these three conditions be uh, applied globally? How can they be tailored? For example, terminology may not be easy to standardize and be open to interpretation and subjectivity. So what about, uh, yes, the, the, the plurality of the world and differences in the, in, in the national culture and the institutions. I would say that the, that the challenge is not in achieving standardization of discourse of problem framings and the achievement of global harmonization. The challenge is actually in resisting it, in resisting particular imaginations of what sort of standardization and what sort of harmonization is right and appropriate. In other words, what the destination should be. And then the, it becomes a sort of problem of mundane politics getting from where we are to the destination. What that does is subverts the capacity to ask what's at stake in the first place, which when you know the deliberative democratic theorists are holding true to their basic ideas, part of what is achieved, as Claire was pointing out, is a clarification of what's at stake through the enrichment of deliberation rather than its truncation. And yet I fear that in the genome editing domain in particular, certainly in the human genome editing domain, because the stakes are so significant and the problems are so complex and the fact of, um, the, of you know, the, the sort of jurisdictional limits of judgments made in any given society and yet the fact that the human, that humanity will be affected because for example, people circulate, people don't stay within the boundaries of, of, the, of the countries in which they are born, et cetera, um, that there is a, a push towards achieving a kind of simplified uniform picture that reaches to, um, search, searches for a foundation that is supposed to lie outside of politics, like the kind of putative universalism of scientific knowledge and expertise. And so what the, uh, there was a commission called the International Commission established by the Royal Society and the um, US National Academies with a certain amount of international participation. And it basically asserted 
that the right way to ask and answer regulatory questions, in other words, the right way to bring about, to lay the groundwork for heritable human genome editing is to adopt a regulatory approach that is essentially an American regulatory approach. The World Health Organization Committee, um, which is led by a formal, former US FDA commissioner, is unfortunately, I think, taking a very similar approach, asking, you know, what does good governance look like where good governance is basically a kind of technocratic formation that reflects particular ways of thinking about um, particular ways of doing regulation and therefore the background commitments to what's at stake in regulation that come out of very particular jurisdictions. And so in ignoring plura plurality and ignoring variation, there is an attenuation of not just the possible approaches that are available, but also the sense of what's at stake in those approaches. And it's all in the name of trying to achieve a sort of standardization or a, a, a kind of globalization of, of, but you achieve globalization by narrowing down participation, both in terms of actors and in terms of views of what's at stake until you find that group that will all sign on to the consensus and you call it global. I mean, that strikes me as, as a recipe for failure. And another question is related to um, the fact that um, you, your presentation is a lot uh, on, uh, uh, with humans, uh, human applications of uh, genome editing. And according to, well, and whereas, um, well, if we take uh, ANSES, uh, ANSES as an institution deals um, with non-human applications of these technologies. So um, according to you, what are the lessons uh, you may draw from uh, your analysis for uh, non-humans? So are non-humans uh, uh, a different yes. matter? So, so I, I meant to say at the outset, and I forgot to, that um, the patterns that I'm observing in, in illustrating in these cases, I see as certainly an American approaches to governance, which of course exert a kind of international force, um, uh, patterns that are present across the board. And that actually they're easier to see. I chose the cases that I did because they're easier to see because um, the the, the um, contested moral issues are right at the surface and yet there is still a retreat back into, as in the first case, um, the assertion of technical authority, not just over the objects of d debate and the questions that need to be asked, but in a, over the debate itself. And of course, that is only heightened in domains where it seems like kind of all that's at stake are issues of public health and safety, of more narrow forms of risk assessment, um, of foodstuffs, of agricultural biotechnology, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, one could substitute other stories for my stories and see how techniques of narrowing are very similar techniques of narrowing uh, are, are um, playing out in those domains as well. So, so I, I see actually very little distinction except for the extent to which there's upfront recognition that there are ethical issues at stake that cannot be subsumed under the sort of, uh, you know, that cannot be straightforwardly subsumed um, under the umbrella of technical expertise. And yet they are still significantly shaped by um, that assertion of scientific sovereignty. I, I can't hear you, Pierre Benoit. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. They reveal general you patterns are. and issues and they yes. are not um, um, some exceptions. Okay, we have two other questions that uh, um, I guess uh, that are addressed to the three speakers. So one is about uh, uh, parliamentary technology assessment. So we have um, in many countries uh, offices of uh, technology assessment. So it happens that in the US, I think. It happens that it happens that it happens So perhaps we can, uh, Claire, uh, you, you can uh, put uh, the screen with the four speakers because we 
um, uh, shift to the general discussion. So, um, uh, so we have in um, in different countries uh, uh, parliamentary uh, technology assessment offices uh, like uh, OPEX in uh, in France uh, or the OTA. <laughs> in the US, which was, uh, I guess, uh, uh, which ended up uh, in 95, uh, if I remember correctly. So the question is uh, on, on the, 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 the role of uh, these uh, offices, uh, according to you, so uh, in um, the different, uh, well, of course, uh, um, uh, in Europe and, and in the US. So uh, uh, Steve, perhaps uh, you can, you want to start with uh, the OTA and uh, is it a uh, missing in the States? <laughs> yeah, I um, mean, the story of um, the Office of Technology Assessment is, um, I think, um, uh, sort of a sad one. I mean, uh, the it, it's originally constructed, um, and the basic structure is to um, split evenly the control over the office between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. Uh, and between the House and the Senate. So with equal numbers of representatives from both of those things, uh, you know, um, controlling the institution. And, and um, you know, it um, did great work for a while, um, but um, uh, through a variety of different things, uh, for example, it's um, uh, opposition to the Reagan uh, Star Wars scheme, some other, um, you know, kind of pro-regulatory things and so on. Uh, it um, raised the ire of a sufficient number of Republicans that when the Republicans won control of the Congress in 1994, they um, uh, disbanded it by defunding it. And the, the law actually is still on the books. The OTA could be reestablished by an act of Congress funding it at any time. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it also, um, I think, uh, while a very useful thing, represents a, a mode of technology assessment that uh, we've probably uh, moved beyond at this point. Um, you know, if you were going to bring back the OTA, I would think it should be substantially reconstituted um, uh, partly to bring in more participatory uh, mechanisms and um, uh, other things of that sort. But um, yeah, that's what, I, so that's the story of the OTA from my point of view in a very um, small nutshell. On the, on the agenda of uh, the Biden administration, this type of, uh, of issues, so technology I, assessment and the new uh, perhaps um, devices or institutions. Um, it, it's true that um, there are um, members of the Democratic Party who would like to revive the OTA, and the fact that it could be done without passing laws, um, you know, makes it um, into something that could be achieved. Um, but um, uh, it's clear that the Biden administration is, uh, you know, pr proceeding from a, a stance um, that wants to. Um, to sort of recapitulate the words of the Obama presidency, put science in its rightful place again. Um, and, um, you know, that may have the potential for putting science and society in the rightful place for the first time. <laughs> but um, if treated as um, uh, just recapitulating what was done in the past with Obama, I, I'm less optimistic about it. Uh, parliamentary yeah. technology assessment offices and the, the role they may play in deliberation on technologies? Um, so I actually read the question in the chat um, in the yeah, in the Q&A um, so I can talk a little bit about the UK but there's not very much to say because we have we do have a parliamentary to, it's called POST a parliamentary office of science and technology um, but certainly compared to the French one, it's much smaller, it's got a lot less resources, and of course, compared to the OTA, the, what was the OTA, again, but I think it's maybe two members of staff, and then they have um, PhDs or postdocs who come and spend six months uh, working there and produce sort of, the main thing that they do is produce like they, two, three page briefs on particular topics, so like, you know, CRISPR or gem crops or whatever, to inform the parliament, the MPs. 
Um, so in that sense, it's similar to the French um, office, but the resources are really, really tiny. Um, again, it's within some of the slides that I skipped due to lack of time, but they, they, there is this tension. I think by asking this question, I think the question asked, um, I'm characterizing it a little bit, but what's the point of public participation? Because we have elected representatives, and they've been elected by citizens, and then they get well informed by scientists using these parliamentary offices, uh, so they get the best possible scientific uh, um, expertise coming from the parliament, these parliamentary offices. So they should be, you know, and they're the, the, the legitimate elected representatives in our, in our parliamentary democracies, and we should just let them get on with it. That's part of the, I think, as could be the argument. And I think, you know, that is a perfectly legitimate argument, but then don't, don't do, if that's your belief, then you shouldn't really do public participation at all. And we, we certainly, we saw this play out in the, night, the first consensus conference in France in 1998, which was organized by the French parliamentary office, by this, and the senator who led it, we could see, you know, there was a, com a constant tension between this, that it was being organized by a senator who quite rightly believed that they were the legitimate representative of French citizens because they had been elected to that position, and why were we asking these 12 bozos or whatever, these 12 people off the street, um, what they thought about it, because they hadn't been elected by anybody. Um, so I think if that's the way we think, then we don't need public participation at all. Um, but if we need to think about what is it in the process of getting those 12 people to deliberate over many days, uh, over a, a six-month period, and to inform themselves, and to talk to each other, and to talk to experts, uh, and then to also present their results to the, both the Parliamentary Office of Technology and the, uh, the, Parliament, the two parliaments. Um, and whether that does something different. And I think that's the question I was posing it in my talk. If you look at the Danish Board of Technology, so which is related to uh, the Parliament, but in a different way, um, uh, or the, to the NOTA, which is now the Rathenau Institute, they are uh, well, technology assessment offices that used to uh, um, uh, involve the public in, the, in different ways. And by the way, uh, consensus conferences were in, invented by the Danish Board of, of Technology in, in the 80s, which leads to another question to Claire, but also to the, the other speakers. Um, how do you perceive citizen juries or citizen uh, uh, conferences or convention on the <laughs> Einstein ladder? Uh, are uh, there factors that my improve gain, uh, well, improve the influence of, uh, or the power of these processes on decision making, assuming that it is uh, possible. Perhaps to our US friends, uh, um, we, we, we have uh, had recently a very big event on climate ch change, the Convention Citoyenne sur le Climat, which involved uh, 150 citizens in a type of uh, citizens uh, uh, convention. Uh, on the climate issue during a period of, uh, of six months. So, Claire, uh, I see the, the, the image is, uh, is fixed, so I, I don't know whether you are still connected. Yes, you are. Okay. Claire and um, Ben and, uh, and Steve. Yeah, I can say something a little bit about that. So, I think uh, the way I understood the question was like, in a sense, are cons where, where do cons consensus or citizens conferences, where can, would we place them on that? on that ladder. Um, and I think my, my answer to that, um, and I've written a bit about this, is that the consensus conference or citizen conference is, is a method, um, and it can be used, as, you know, it's a tool in a sense, um, but then the way in which it's used will determine where it is on that ladder. Um, so, and again, going back, it's the motivations of the people using it can place it right at the bottom or right at the top. And again, in the 1990s, we saw consensus conferences being used, as I said, on specifically on GM crops um, around the world, um, and then we've seen them being used again um, after that. And we could, we could see in different places, I mean, so the Danish one, that, that they did one, where there was a much more direct link, with, uh, with, with, at least with Parliament, because in Denmark, especially at that time, and not just till the case, whenever there was a consensus conference, the reports went to Parliament, and Parliament had to debate the results of the, the, 
the output of the conference and might not make a decision, but they at least had to discuss it. That's not, that wasn't the case at all in the UK, where it was organized by the research councils. Um, and in France, they were sent them, but they didn't have to um, debate it or, or, or make a decision. And in the same period in the UK, we had a consensus conference organized by a couple of NGOs. Off the top of my head, I think it was Greenpeace, but I might be wrong. Um, and, um, and we could see that the, the process was very different and the kind of empowerment of the citizens was different. But of course, then there was no link at all with decision making. So my, answer, my quick answer is that it's, it's a tool and it, it, that the tool itself doesn't determine where it's placed up or down that ladder. Um, we have also um, a question for, um, for the three of you, but perhaps uh, Steve or Ben, you want to um, um, elaborate on this question? I, mean, I, I could, um, I could like, come in on it briefly. Reading. I mean, um, I completely agree with what Claire is saying about these being various methods that can be used in different ways. And then I think that the other question to ask is sort of what's the genesis of the participatory impulse? You know, does it come from the center or does it come from outside? Is it a response to protest or what? You know, when we talk about public participation, we tend to talk about these formal mechanisms. But you could also say that, for example, in the um, late 1980s when um, a, a movement to uh, ask private U.S. universities to divest their holdings in South African um, companies as a, a support for the um, uh, end of apartheid, you know, and they occupied university offices and demanded meetings with the university finance officials, that could be understood as a form of pu public participation as well, and it doesn't get listed in the methods when they get listed, um, you know, it seems to me that, um, you know, who is asking who to participate, under what terms and connected to what um, particular actions um, is um, uh, an important element. And some things that can be understood as public participation just don't count as it uh, within the industry of consultants and others who produce public participation, uh, you know, um, uh, engagements. As a, as a professional service. A little bit to that, agreeing very much with, agreeing very much with what Steve said. I, I, I think also, and I mean, this is just totally in line with what both Steve and Claire have said. One has to think of these mechanisms as not self-contained machineries, but as choreographed elements that are part of a larger dance. And oftentimes that dance is less choreographed, but is, you know, unfolds through habit or through whatever um, heritage. And and uh, so I think that in asking questions about, for example, the connection with decision making, that's a complex relationship that shouldn't be conceived of narrowly as, a, you know, what's the degree of input? Is it advisory? Is it whatever? Um, but rather, are these spaces of expression where that expression wouldn't happen otherwise? that filter into dynamics that are unfolding and would unfold according to a kind of status quo, but for these kinds of interventions. And the efficacy of those interventions as critical interventions that may have potentially significant effects on decision-making, maybe not on this one narrow thing, but on the ways in which what decisions need to be taken are even understood wholesale in advance down the line. I mean, those are, those are dimensions that are too easily written out of the picture because it's seen as a cog in a kind of linear process. Um, but as I mean, as Steve is pointing out, you know, more or less choreographed, um, the modes of participation are often emergent, um, and seeing the conditions of possibility for emergence or the ways in which those conditions of possibility are constrained seems to me to be the important question and one of the important functions that a choreographed participatory event can. Can, one of its important functions can be to expose the ways in which there are constraints that are imposed that just seem natural and therefore unremarkable. And the, the, the idea of the, the choreograph, um, it, 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 it echoes uh, Claire's point on, uh, uh, well, um, 
the complex view of the decision process also. So uh, the decision process is not uh, linear. Uh, there's not one point where you take all the decision. And so uh, we have to integrate also this uh, complexity of the decision process. It's not, you know, uh, in, the, in the picture. So they, they are perhaps, uh, um, we, we, we are uh, close to the, the end of the, of the, of this, uh, uh, webinar and uh, we have a question to, we, we, which is um, addressed to three of, of you and uh, uh, it's a, it is as follow what could be a desirable expert society relationship uh, to for risk assessment of uh, of of biotech so uh, i guess that uh, you, in a way you, you've answered and uh, uh, perhaps uh, first uh, with ben because ben if if i understood you well you better uh, define the conditions that makes that it's not possible than the conditions that make that uh, we, we, we can, uh, for instance, answers as an institution, really integrate the concerns uh, you raised according to your uh, analysis. So if you turn that positively, so this is the question raised. Uh, what would be desirable expert society relationships for risk assessment of biotech? So of course, that's a hard question and I have no singular answer to it. But my, I guess my singular answer is that there shouldn't be a singular answer. In, we live in a moment in which science and technology are so constitutive of our lives and exert such profound effects on the directions of our lives and society that the question of the relationship between expertise and democracy is a fundamental uh, is a fundamentally constitutional question it's a question of of delegation of authority of the separation of powers of accountability of the ways in which societies make sense of how they should live what matters to them what is at stake for their lives and therefore what should they aspire to and and if we conceive of those problems in narrowly circumscribed terms as what do we do about x technology or y risk we neglect the extent to which that presumes a set of well institutional relations which are fundamentally democratic regimes of democratic governance we take those for granted and don't make those objects of question and so i guess i would say that the in a positive sense, the sort of the, the kind of relation between expertise and democratic governance that we should aspire to is one that recognizes its position, the, the position of, of knowledge, of epistemic authority and of technical capacity um, as government and, and seeks to experiment with and aspire to um, forms of democratic ordering that takes seriously the need to establish checks and balances, sort out the appropriate forms of 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 um, of delegation and its limits, and so forth. I don't; those aren't questions we ask once and then move on. Those are questions that should be explicit and live in every single moment in which we ask any particular question about about a, a given risk or assessment of a given technology. Uh, on our end, and uh, well, uh, it makes me think uh, that um, Jean-Pierre Dupuis uh, uses to say that uh, we're transformed. We are not anymore scientists. We are more engineers and uh, apprentis sorciers, and so we are able to do more than we are able to think on what we do. So this uh, issue of um, you know the maturation of uh, our understanding of what we do. Uh, I guess uh, makes that uh, we have to deal also not only with the general public but also the role of uh, humanities, philosophers, social scientists, uh, STS, and so on. So I guess that it is important to uh, uh, well uh, take that into into the picture of the of the of the problem and the possible solutions, uh, right? Okay, so absolutely. you agree? So, Absol uh, abs no absolutely. There, 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 there can be no presumptive monopoly on the right form of expertise when, 
when you know such an expansive range of dimensions of social life are at stake so yes absolutely <laughs> okay um steve uh, you, you want to um I, I i guess um the same I, mean, question. I, I i agree with um ben's um take on this question i guess the only thing i would add you know while we're looking at the sort of positive side of things is i think it's quite encouraging when organizations like ANSYS, um, uh, you know, call uh, major conferences together, you know, to address these kinds of issues. It, that, um, I think, is a, a, a worthy development and one that speaks toward, um, you know, wanting to um, conduct the kind of societal conversation uh, without an end that Ben is um, imagining. Claire, huh? you, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, so uh, if the question is how ANSES and other agencies like it could, um, how we can move forward for them to take on board public participation, I'll give an answer that builds on Ben's but, um, and might be slightly strange, but I'd say look more closely at the work of the, the, the contributions of the scientists and the way in which they work. So, because there's, um, instead of thinking that there's this scientific knowledge which is completely unproblematic and we need to think about how to uh, um, involve public participants who are problematic and have biases and perceptions and all that, um, we know that scientists have biased and they're people, they're human beings, um, and they have biases and perceptions and they have particular ways of working and they come from particular disciplines which means they know about some things and not other things. And the more we understand that and the more we talk about it, then the more we can understand that we need different perspectives, which can be different uh, non-scientists as well as different kinds of scientists will help us. And try to understand why scientists can disagree on, you know, on, this, on the basis of the same data, scientists will come up with different um, conclusions. And it, this doesn't mean that one of the scientists is right and the other one is wrong, usually, or that one is a bad and corrupt one and the other one is a good one. Um, so, and some of the biases, and, and Ben showed us as well, you know, quite clearly that are about a particular technology or product being necessarily for the public good. And if we have scientists or scientific committees usually who are starting from that premise without it being um, opened up to more deliberation, I think that that's a problem. If you, well, um Perhaps um, no, non-French people do not know this story, but uh, at the time in the in the in the 90s, uh, Philippe Roqueplou was um, a sociologist very influential on the way the government took uh, uh, the issue of uh, risk assessment in the in the period of, of crisis, and um, he was one of the promoters of uh, the first uh, French citizen conference and one of the point, in, point important for Philippe Rocopo was that uh, it was not about what the, t the citizens think about the technology but more how the, this choreography uh, um, was um, able to show the differences between the experts, uh, the scientists and different views that this was really one of the point of uh, the, the this public debate. So it's a it's a way to uh, perform a, a, a public debate among scientists and the citizens are at the core because of their capacity, their ability to to raise questions, uh, questions that are related to uh, you know the daily life uh, and, and questions that are not in the world of the scientists. So instead of uh, looking for the same language, actually, this ability to look at science for, from the outside um, uh, is, is uh, something which is uh, obviously very, uh, very important. And perhaps uh, um, to quote um, Andy Sterling, the ability of this type of devices to o open up uh, the, 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 the possibilities rather than close down, which is uh, something which is made by the institutions, the markets, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, I guess that we are close to the end of the of this uh, this session. Um, I'm very grateful for for for, for to the, the three of you. It was a really uh, um, 
really interesting, uh, nice, uh, nice uh, well presentation and uh, a very um, uh, nice um, discussion. Also, um, I guess that uh, ANSES uh, will uh, well uh, take that on board. <laughs> we will be discussing that. Uh, uh, at the scientific council uh, at ANSES, and there, there will be a, a compte rendu of uh, all the all the sessions. And I guess that uh, this will be a basis for further uh, discussion because uh, it's only the tenth uh, anniversary of uh, ANSES. So, um, well, it's uh, just a, a point in the in a long trajectory. And I guess, and uh, well, uh, as you said, um, uh, it's a very uh, uh, well. Uh, we, we may have some hope when we see that uh, ANSES did it. <laughs> so, of course, uh, it's not the end of the story, but uh, it's, a, it's a good point um, in, the, in the process. So, once again, um, thanks, um, Claire, uh, Steve, and, and Ben. And, uh, well, um, see you soon, I hope, uh, when we can <laughs> uh, do that uh, in presence. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Bye bye. Thanks to all the, the, the participants to the questions, and uh, we we will follow up. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye.